as opposed to if you call from a landline, it'll give us your exact address. So that's probably, if you ever call 911 and they're asking what your address is, it's probably because you're calling from a cell phone. So in other words, it's easier to find a location from a home phone than Correct. from a cell phone. Yeah. Interesting. We do have ways to get your location from a cell phone, like if somebody has an emergency and they're on a cell phone and they hang up or the call drops or something, we can call the cell phone company. It takes a little while because there are forms we have to fill out. We have to verify that it is for law enforcement purposes that we're requesting your phone be pinged, but we can track it. It just takes a lot longer. So in a theoretical kidnapping situation, <laughs> someone calls you um, on the cell phone, but they don't know where they are. How long does it take you to get that information and find out, you know, pinging them, getting the permission from the cell phone company, filling out the forms? How long does that take? Uh, it takes between 15 to 30 minutes, so it's, it, it's a little tricky. Um, guys, we have more questions from uh, for Wendy, uh, but actually, first, I want to start off with something else. I know that earlier, um, we did a cuckoo um, asking you all how much you knew about her job, um, but we actually have a second cuckoo we're going to do right now. And this Kahoot is going to ask Wendy how much she knows about you. So keep the bonds away. This Kahoot is not for you right now. This Kahoot is to embarrass Wendy a little bit. So Wendy, do you have a cell phone? Can you take out that cell phone? And uh, Ms. Cowan is going to go ahead and put up this code for you. And I want Wendy to get in first. Once Wendy's in, we'll let other people in in just a second. But Wendy, you're going to go to Kahoot.it. And you're going to enter that seven digit code. Let me know when you're in. Yes. 
as good as being smart. I love it. Good job. Here we go. Last one. Punch it five. Live, live those tables got it. Last question. Which account has the most followers on TikTok? I mean, I don't even think that's physically possible. 
So they sent someone to investigate, um, but also got him some mobile homes. Yeah. Sounds like a good response. But wow, this is a very crazy problem. Um, all right. What does, uh, how does your job help save lives during a medical emergency? Um, well, my department doesn't actually provide like medical uh, advice over the phone. Like we're not equipped to give CPR instructions or anything like that over the phone. So when somebody calls us with a medical emergency, we transfer them to LA County Fire. However, we stay on the line with them to make sure it's not something that we do need to respond to. So if, like for example, if someone says they can't breathe or something, uh, we're gonna get them medical attention. However, we wanna know why is it that you can't breathe? Were you being attacked? Did somebody choke you? Like we need to know like the, is there a crime involved as well? So in other words, if I'm having a medical emergency, I call 911, you'll pick up, um, and if there's a crime involved, you'll stay on that one to make sure that uh, you know I'm safe. But if it's just a medical emergency, a uh, heart attack, something like that, once it's transferred over to LA County Fire, you guys can kind of let it go and put it in there. Correct, yeah. Cool. Um, next question, what's the uh, scariest phone call you've ever received? Um, okay, so I have two. Oh, okay. One, I would say, it was scarier for me before I came a mom, became a mom. So that one was uh, some lady was saying that she was getting uh, eaten up by her boyfriend. And I was on the phone with her while she was getting eaten up. Like, I could hear her getting smacked around. Um, that was pretty scary. Uh, I felt that for her. Uh, the other one, after I became a mom, was uh, a, a baby that couldn't breathe. Anytime there's any falls with babies not breathing, we, we send immediate response, uh, meaning our deputies respond as well. I, uh, mm -hmm. you know if the baby was okay? Yeah, the baby was fine. Before I got off the line, the baby started crying, which means the baby's breathing, so. That's good. Yeah, it was pretty relieving. Yeah, I totally, I feel like that story was making me sad. And yeah. I'm glad the baby was okay. Um, and do we know, you know, the woman who is in that abusive relationship? Um, what kind of steps would you take in a situation like that? Obviously, you send um, someone to you know, stop the situation. Well, I keep, anytime there's something, a situation like where uh, there's an active crime going on, like for example that, uh, I stay on the line with them. I, even if, you know, they can't talk, the line is verbally or something, I need to to hear something on the line while the deputies get there. Once the deputies are there, it's in their hands and they're able to handle it based on whatever's happening. But, um, I, if, if it's a serious emergency like that, I have to keep the callers on the line. Or if it's like a burglary in progress, somebody's breaking into your house, I keep the callers on the line. Just in case the burglar pulls out a gun or something on them, you know? So you have to listen to all I have to listen to it, yeah. That kind of goes back to earlier when we were talking about how stressful the job would be. That sounds very stressful to have to listen to it. Yeah, I definitely have to Our next question. Do you sometimes do overtime, and do you take graveyard shifts? I feel like you've already answered this a little bit, but is there anything else you want to add to uh, this question? Um, yeah, I definitely do overtime. Uh, there's some places where it's mandatory to do overtime. I know Lancaster Station has mandatory overtime, but like Fort Scott's is mandatory overtime, which means you don't have a choice. You either go where you get rid of them, or you find somebody to take your overtime, which doesn't really happen. Uh, in graveyard shifts, that's why it's scheduled for now. Are you hoping to eventually go to a different schedule? Yeah, I'm actually transferring stations. Very so, cool. Yeah. I heard about this actually at the mailbox. Right. right. Yeah. Um, you guys don't need to know our name. We got them. All right. They're all awesome. Um, Rogelio wants to know, what happens if you can't get someone's location because they're, say, kidnapped? We kind of already talked about this one a little bit. You request the records uh, or the ability to ping after you've got the forms from uh, for the company that does the cell phone. Is there anything else we should know in this situation? Someone's kidnapped, you want to get their location? Anything else that might help? Uh, well, I mean, if you guys are ever in a situation where you're being kidnapped, try your absolute best to see any, anything that you see around you, like, you know, a McDonald's, a post office, anything that you can pinpoint that you can let us know that's around you, that would help a lot because the phone will track will ping wherever you are at the moment of the call, but let's say the kidnapper takes you five miles away. If by the time we get the ping, So you almost need to know uh, all the details that that person needs to. Yeah, as best as possible. Um, I believe we have a few more questions from Instagram. Is there a time as an emergency dispatcher where you felt like you failed? It's a kind of hard question. I want to 
say as of now, I don't think so. Uh, thankfully. Um, I can't think of a situation where I haven't been able to get somebody help in a, in a timely manner. That's really cool. I hope that stays that way forever. I hope so too. <laughs> um, we do have some questions from some of our teachers. Um, so I asked a few teachers what questions they have for Wendy. Um, the first teacher I asked is Miss Coffee. And Miss Coffee asked, can you hang up on a caller? Someone's calling you, you are wanting to hang up. Can you do it? Uh, it depends on the circumstance. Like, is it like hanging up on them because you're frustrated with them or hanging up because you're Equipment to be able to pull them out of ditches and stuff like that. 
Um, there's also like Angeles Crest Highway that uh, goes through there. So sometimes there's some vehicles that will fly off the road if they're if they're you know driving too fast. Yeah. So we need certain equipment to pull the people out. And uh, our search and rescue is trained with special equipment to be able to pull them out. And that's their office there that they have with their maps and. Um, we have a sergeant that's assigned to them who like does all their training and stuff, and then we have you know, reserve deputies who are especially trained in that. They have to go to a certain academy to specialize in, in how to pull people out of like really rural and rugged uh, areas. So if someone gets lost in the hike, that's one thing, but someone you know drives a car off the cliff in the mountains, yeah. the same group as uh, rescue. Them. Right. Yeah. Here's our second picture. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. This is the entrance to the jail. Um, to the right, on that side, those little uh, keys that you see dangling are the uh, gun lockers. In the jail, we're not allowed to have any type of weapons. So uh, if a deputy is going in there, they have to take their gun out first and lock it in there before they go inside. We have our uh, watch commander who does three jail checks a shift. So whenever he or she's going in, they also have to deposit their uh, gun in there and lock it up and then go inside. And then at this particular station, we dedicated our jail to uh, one of our jailers who passed away. I want to say it was three years ago. He had a lot of medical issues. So that's why we have the thing on the placard on top that says Flip's Cave. Our captain decided to uh, make it like a memorial for him because he used to always say that that was his cave. So that's the jail. And here's our next uh, picture. Tell us, uh, this looks like search and rescue as well. Yeah, that was the entrance to search and rescue. Very cool. And what are we looking at in this picture? This is the report writing room. This is where deputies go in to write their reports, any kind of reports that they have. We have a bunch of like, extra uh, forms and stuff that take to fill out there, such as like the form called CHP 180, which is when they tow a vehicle. They have to fill that out. Um, we have extra uh, evidence type forms and all that stuff there. Anytime they want to book evidence, they can go in there to do that too. Thanks. Our next uh, photo. What are we looking at here? This is a holding cell. So when somebody gets taken into custody and they're arrested, um, that is where they're held before they're transferred to the back to one of the jail cells in the back. Um, and this is where usually they're they're hanging out while they're getting processed and booked and getting mugshot taken. So this is different than the jail we saw earlier. No, that, that was the entrance to the jail. Okay. And then this is like the first few cells you see in the beginning because they're just. A, like what we call the holding cells. Okay. Yeah, so that's where they're first brought in when, when they're taken into custody. And our next picture? That is the gun locker that I was uh, The one we saw earlier. Yeah. And tell me about this picture. This is uh, desk operations, aka dispatch. This is where I work. That is my seat over there on that corner. And then this is my watch deputy. Um, he oversees like the units and stuff throughout the uh, shift. And as you can see, we have like the various monitors. The monitor that you see at the top with the blue is where our phone calls come in. And then we have the screen next to it, which is where the calls are pinged. And then the screen next to that is where we uh, see where our units are. Like we have a tracker on every one of the patrol cars because we're in charge of making sure that we know where our units are throughout the ship. Uh, Immediately next to that is the uh, communicator for uh, other stations. So as opposed to picking up the phone and calling them, we can call them through the radio right there. Uh, below that is the uh, frequency that we're monitoring. So sometimes, like, if we have a search and rescue operation going on, we have to have a separate frequency on the radio for search and rescue. Um, so they'll be, we'll be monitoring them on that frequency, but then we have our regular units who are working out in the field, not in the mountains, and we need to monitor them as well. Um, and then right in front of the watch deputy, the blue screen, the greenish blue screen that you see there, is where we type in our calls. Uh, next to that screen on that side is where we have a list of what units are going to what calls and what units have gone to what calls. Um, as you can see, my screen right here, uh, with all, with the, what is that? Six boxes right there, nine boxes. Uh, that's the cameras that show me everything going on at the station. And then up at the top, we also have our jail cameras and outside of the jail. So we also need to like keep an eye on the jailers since there's no weapons inside of the, the jail. 
Uh, sometimes inmates can get a little wooly and try to attack the jailers, so we need to make sure we're keeping an eye on them. So in case something happens, our watch deputy is able to run over it. Out. So your job is not only to be taking phone calls, but also to be watching what's happening at the location as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I noticed all this high-tech equipment, and it's really, really cool. And then I noticed right here in the middle, um, here is Starbucks. I respect that, you're happy. Um, and then a old-fashioned red phone. Like, tell me about the red phone in the middle that has, it doesn't seem like it connects to anything else. Uh, the red phone is like an alternate line for us to be able to communicate to SCC, which is the Sheriff's Communication Center. It's located in uh, East LA, and anytime we have a big sort of event, like a pursuit, or we have a unit following a stolen vehicle, or something like that, we need to be able to have the uh, Sheriff's Communication Center on the line with our watch commander, so that they're uh, able to quick, more quickly monitor and communicate with the unit who's out in the field conducting their uh, investigations. Uh, at some point, our watch commander can decide, hey, tell them to what we call 22, which means cancel whatever you're doing, back off, you know, just let let them go. There's other stuff going on. So th that's what that phone is for. Very cool. Um, tell us about this right here. This is our barbecue area. Uh, not every station has this. This was actually a gift from um, one of the search and rescue teams a few years ago. Um, this is where we have like our Halloween parties. Uh, and it's like a station thing. Everybody brings their family. We have the community there. Um, we'll have a, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, National Night Out, where you're able to meet uh, police officers and uh, sheriff's personnel and see what they do and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically what this is. I love it. Um, you mentioned Halloween, and I've got to know, are you dressing up for Halloween? I am. What are you going to dress up like? So my, myself, my husband, and my daughter are doing a family thing. We're, we're going to the Blistums. Please don't. That's super cute. How many of you guys are dressing up for Halloween this year? I love it. Dress up and come to school. We want to see your costume. It's so much fun on that one. I, I want to tell you guys not to try make sure you're going to get it. You guys all know the fun stuff, but do you guys know the movie Pico? Yes. I'm going to be the tall, dorky guy. I'm gonna, my wife's going to prick me the pregnant lady. But she's not pregnant. She just has a big baby. Alright. Should be fun. I like it. Alright. Wendy, can you tell us a little bit about this picture right here? Okay, so this is also the cells. Um, these cabinets that we have below right here are where they keep like any type of like supplies that uh, people in Lisbon might need, like toothbrushes, shoes, like shirts, that kind of stuff, and um, like emergency type things, like if they need like bandages or something like that. And stuff like that. Very cool. And what are we looking at here? This is a holding cell um, in the jail. Uh, look at the comfy mattresses. How many people would spend time in a holding cell at a time? Um, in a holding cell, we try to keep it just one at a time. But if there's a lot of people in custody, we'll have two to three people. And that would be why you have different mattresses. Right. Um, tell us about, this actually looks similar to the picture we saw earlier. It looks like a different angle. Are we seeing anything new in this one? Um, just a shotgun over there on the front door. On the front door. Tell us about that. Uh, that's not the front door. That's actually the exit. To, so when you walk into the station, you see you have the windows to, to uh, dispatch. And then that's the door that leads out to the station. Um, I don't know, honestly. I think that that's just a, a policy that they have, that we have to have a shotgun in there. Um, you know, in case there, there's some type of like active shooter situation. Or something. Someone's trying to like storm the building or something. Like Correct. That. Yeah. And okay, tell me about this picture. This is the jailer's office. So the jailers have to input a lot of information when they take you into custody. They, they put a lot of information into the system. Um, and also when they they are released, they take them out of the system. So there's a lot of information that they have to put in there. So that's um, the jailer's office. Okay. What about this one? That's the entrance to one of the jail cells. This one is another jail cell, I can tell. Yeah. But we see something new off of the front. Tell us about that. That's a toilet. It's a shared toilet. There's no privacy in jail. There's no curtain. There's nothing. That's a bummer. All right. Tell us about this one here. This stores the inmates' food. So every day we have uh, food delivered for the inmates. Uh, we also have uh, inmate workers that work at the stations. 
with, they do all their all our uh, maintenance and tech, that kind of stuff. So all their meals and stuff, their drinks are stored in there. Okay, but this looks like the same one that we saw earlier. Um, anything you want to tell us about that? Is that a water fountain on top of the toilet? Is that a what? A water fountain on top of the toilet? Let's just sink. Okay, I was like, yeah. drinking it just seemed like a bad place to do. All right, <laughs> sink makes a little more sense. Um, what are we looking at here? This is a shower in the jail. And it's a, uh, sh a curtain for this. There's a little door, but it's see through. Okay. No privacy for real, it sounds like, yeah. Tell us about, uh, well, before we move on to this one, can you tell us what is the idea behind the no privacy? Obviously, you know, we like our privacy at home. What's the idea behind having no privacy there? Um, well, they have to be able to monitor what, what they're doing at all times. Uh, there have been situations where inmates have committed suicide, so they need to be able to make sure that, you know, they're not using any of the resources they have there against them. Uh, I hear a few people being a little disrespectful, and I want to remind you all that uh, we are better than them, and we're going to act like it. All right, here we go. Our next one. Tell us about this one. Uh, this is where they do the live scanning, which is uh, where they take their fingerprints, their mug shots, and all that kind of stuff. They stand up against the uh, gray poster that's right there, the gray screen, and that's where they take their mug, sh mug shots. Uh, we have a projector up at the top back here that is able to shoot the photo. Um, and then the, the machine right there is just where you put your fingers and they're scanned onto the system. So like scanning fingerprints or whatever. Correct, yeah. Um, we have time for a few questions from you all. Um, so if you guys have a question for Wendy, um, just raise your hand. We will be going through uh, these for uh, maybe six or seven minutes. So we've got time for maybe, uh, we'll, we'll see how long the questions take, but I'm thinking maybe three to four minutes, something like that. Um, our three to four questions, but we'll see. Our first one. Have you ever gotten a call from Kim Chung? Like, have you ever gotten a call from Kim saying, like, how did it go? A uh, call from a child? Yeah. Uh, for the most part, the ones that I've gotten are accidental. The kids playing on the phone and they accidentally dial 911. Nowadays, uh, iPhones, I think there's a button on there. If you can press it, if you press it long enough, it'll dial 911. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're usually accidental calls, thank God. So what do you do when a kid calls accidentally? I still call back. Uh, there's a button that we press that the call back. So I'll still call back and I'll speak to an adult and just verify that everything's okay. On the off chance that something sounds a little weird, like the child was like taken away from the phone or something, I'll definitely have a deputy go out and verify that the child's okay. Our next question. Um, do you like what you do? Absolutely. This job, you, you, you definitely have to like what you do to do it. Uh, if your heart's not in it, you're not going to be willing to help people, and that's really unfortunate because you always want to look at things from, you know, what, what would I do if that, was, if that was me in that situation? You wouldn't want to call somebody, if you were in, a, in, in an emergency situation, you wouldn't want to call somebody who's not willing to help you. Hey guys, um, I'm seeing some of my students who are going to be losing points for today, Layla. Um, I want to make sure that you guys are making smart choices. Um, Alright, our next question. Um, have you ever gotten like, a call from a family member or somebody you know? Um, yeah, a call from what? A family member? Like or my personal family member? Yeah. No, thankfully, no. <laughs> she asked to, uh, if it was anyone you know. Still no for that one as well? No. Let's do our next question. How much money do you make? Oh. Um, Wendy, if you do not want to answer that, you definitely do not have to. Um, it is a fair question, though, uh, from Agala. Do you have anything you want to say, or should we skip it and move on to another one? Um, I know that um, emergency dispatchers, I think, are a little underpaid. Uh, I know that they make pretty decent money for uh, LA County. I know that other counties are, are pretty underpaid, but um, I would say the money's not too bad. So in other words, not maybe as much as you think they deserve, they work a really special job. Yeah. But especially if you're staying in LA County, it's enough to like have a, have a family, have a comfortable life. Correct. Right. Cool. Um, let's go ahead and do another question. Have you ever gotten a call from a missing 
see child? Like the child was missing and, oh, no, I haven't. I'm trying to work the whole room and it's not easy because I'm, I know I'm passing a lot of people, but I have not got a lot of people over on this side. So I'm going to move over here and we're going to do two more questions. I'm sorry. I love seeing all the freshmen in the middle though have such great questions. dispatch and, and ask them, can you tell us what happened with that? Because usually, even in a situation where it's an emergent, an actual emergency, as soon as the deputies get there, we're off the phone. We don't know what happened. Did your house actually get broken into? Did, you know, did the person, was a real person really holding you at night point? Like, what is it that happened? So once the phone is off, like, we don't hear anything else, we have to wait until the incident is cleared, and then the, the units are free to come in and let us know what it is that ended up happening with that. But yeah, that's, that's something that gets to people because they're like, I want to know what ended up happening with that kid, you know, or what happened with that lady. And yeah. We got one more question. Hi. 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 Just like a little experience on the show. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, what was your big, What was the biggest fight in the like the prison, the so the cells that you've ever experienced on your job? You... The biggest fight? Yes. I, I don't work in the jail. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a waste of time. Thankfully, our, our, our jailers haven't dealt with too many crazy people, but I do know that a jailer at uh, East LA was brutally, brutally attacked by, uh, she was like this tiny little thing, like five foot two or something, and weighed like 100 pounds, and this guy was like three, 400 pounds, like six foot eight. And he, he attacked her so bad to the point where she needed, I believe she needed back surgery. Uh, and she ended up retiring actually after that. She was just insane. Um, Wendy, I know there's lots of other questions. And what we're going to do now uh, is actually transition a little bit. Because we still have a little bit of time left for the period. But I actually want you guys to be able to ask Wendy those questions in person. Be able to take pictures with her. Be able to meet her. I know some of you guys. Um, I know some of you in my class, there are five of you who literally have this job for your presentation that you're going to be doing starting next week. Um, and you might want to ask her, meet her, take a picture. Some of you maybe just want to because you're interested in the job or to thank her for coming out. Um, now we are not leaving, we're not packing up, and we are not talking. We are still listening. Um, but I do want us to go ahead and give Wendy a big round of applause. Thank you so much. For
Um, so I don't want to embarrass you too much, but is there anything you want to say to the students? Who really quick? I wanted to say thank you to all of you guys, because I can't do these things without all of you. So I'm really um, thankful to be here with you. Um, and there's a third thing, though. There's a third thing you know about Miss Poppy. It's that she likes more than any adult woman should. Farting. She thinks farts are hilarious, and it's a little bit embarrassing, but it's true. Am I wrong? It's true. It's true. So, uh, as a science teacher, I know you guys have probably seen her like every fart uh, book in her classroom, and you've heard her talk about body stuff way more than you want. Here is your moment, guys. We are going to tell Miss Coffey that we appreciate her from the very bottom of our part. I mean, bottom of our part. Yeah, bottom of our part. Um, so I'm going to turn off the mics. Miss Coffey's going to turn off the mics. And on the count of three, you're all going to make a farting sound. And that's how we tell her. So, I want it to be loud, though. I want it to be loud. 